Robin Roberts, one on one with Mike Rice, the one time Rutgers coach who exploded. All of it caught on tape. Tonight, coming clean for the first time, a 2020 exclusive. Uh, you go and you continue. Sorry. Robin with the tough questions any parent would ask about a coach crossing the line with their kids. There are many people saying there is no way this man should ever coach again. Plus, extra foam double latte, along with a handful of painkillers. The doctor with a prescription pad caught on tape working out of a Starbucks. But it's what he would do next. <laughs> like you'll see the sting right here on 2020. And the doctor talking only to us. They don't teach you this in medical school. But they teach you ethics. And just this week, could this woman being strip searched by the cops get them in hot water because of it? A special prosecutor weighing in now. They forcefully took off all of my clothes. Tonight, the tape they can't erase. Here now, David Muir. Tonight, if you're a parent, you've likely seen one of those coaches on the sidelines, out of bounds, out of control, losing it. But we had never seen anything quite like this. You'll remember the one-time Rutgers coach hurling basketballs and homophobic slurs at his players. Well, tonight here, he is speaking out about it for the first time. The Robin Roberts exclusive. The coach saddled with regret, hoping for redemption, Knowing it's the tape, he can't erase. Me versus you too. I probably just me versus you. It's a scene that goes on all over America. Sunday afternoon, here on the Jersey Shore. 15-year-old Michael and his dad shooting a few ah. hoops in the driveway. Yeah. Now I'm going to show you what dads all across America do. His sister Katie offering tips to dad. Keep doing that. You can't get to it. A college basketball coach you had likely never heard of before Mike Rice was featured in the highlight reel seen round the world. Take a look at this shocking video making headlines this morning. A basketball coach from Rutgers University caught on tape attacking his college players. Rutgers University coach Mike Rice losing it. <laughs> kicking players in the rear end, hurling balls at their heads and their groins, smacking them with foam pads, big, strong athletes against their coach, defenseless. <laughs> and when you turn up the sound, you hear the verbal abuse. <laughs> ranting, swearing, even screaming homophobic slurs. The story went viral earlier this year, unleashing cries of outrage. New Jersey Governor Chris Christie weighed in. What parent would let this animal back into their living room to try to recruit their son? And if Mike Rice was Kobe Bryant's coach? I would have smacked the hell out of him. I mean, no question about it. Rice became a punchline on The Daily Show. Go Scarlet Knights! Clear eyes, full hearts, fairies. Spoofed on Saturday Night Live. You take that ball, and you put it through that hole, and I won't hit you with the bat. And sports commentators uh, cried one. foul. Why does this man still have a job as the head basketball coach for Rutgers University? He should be fine. When the story exploded, so did Mike's career. I met him and his wife, Carrie, last week for a no-holds-barred conversation. When it became public, what was your reaction? My first reaction when I saw the tape was one of shock, of sadness that I would put myself in a situation like this. How do you defend throwing a ball at players, striking players, the verbal abuse, the anti-gay slurs? Yeah, you don't. <laughs> it's unacceptable. It's something that I'll never get over. When Mike came home, after the public had seen that video. What was it like at home? It was devastating for all of us to live through those first few days, especially with the video being played over and over again. The video made Mike Rice the poster boy for abusive coaching. But he's hardly the first coach to be caught behaving badly. Yeah, he's got technical. Former Indiana Hoosiers coach Bobby Knight, famous for his temper tantrums. Look at here, look at here. Passion and competitive drive are a big part of the culture of basketball. And for Rice, it's a family tradition. His mother was a college player. His father himself an intense coach and NBA broadcaster. You could say that Mike was born to coach basketball. Every one of my immediate family had earned a Division I scholarship. And you have state champions and you have... Uh, Hall of Famers. It was fun. It was fun being raised in that in that type of environment. 
Your father has the distinction of being the only broadcaster to be ejected from a game for arguing a call. He's certainly unique and uh, pass it along. We have a lot of passion and a lot of energy uh, and a lot of intensity. New York Times reporter Jonathan Mahler has been following Rice for six months. He had a very particular upbringing. He is wired a certain way. Uh, he's an incredibly intense, passionate, emotional person. These are things that helped make him a successful and a very good basketball coach. But they are also things that made him unable to, to control himself. Those emotions carried Rice and his team on a three-year winning streak at Robert Morris University, a small western Pennsylvania school. Then, the break of a lifetime, the big leagues, head coach at Rutgers University, annual salary $650,000. The mandate, get the team out of dead last and fast. The media were calling us the leftovers the inexperienced coach from a small school in western Pennsylvania. I had a chip on my shoulders. I think I put a lot on myself to, to show people, A, that I could do it, and B, that this program was going to take off, was going to change, and, and I was going to uh, help change it. Were you ready? Looking back now, no. I let uh, some of that pressure, some of that stress dictate uh, some things that I did, some mistakes that I made. Mike's credo, practice must be harder than games. That temper never far from the surface. I thought it was necessary to get my team or that individual to, to be tougher. Good assistant coach right now will keep him away from the officials. And Rice was plenty tough on the sidelines during games, even getting himself thrown out, an early warning sign that his emotions were getting out of control. So Rutgers second year head coach will become a spectator. Then Rutgers athletic director Tim Pernetti sat him down after losing to the Louisville Cardinals. Well, I got two technicals in Louisville. So Tim Pernetti said, you're such a good coach. Why will you embarrass yourself and certainly university in, in acting like that? So yeah, people did try to warn me. Even his wife tried to warn him about his on-court language. The language, my wife had talked to me about the language for three years. Do you remember the conversations you had with him and what you said to him? There were times when the language was, was definitely inappropriate. What I would try and say was, you're such a great coach, you have such an incredible passion and intensity, can you, can you be that way and not use the language? And, you know, he'd say, yes, yes, I'll try, I'll try. But it was getting too late for warnings. One of his assistant coaches, former NBA player Eric Murdoch, had a falling out with Rice. When Murdoch's contract was not renewed, he left, determined to expose the head coach's controversial methods. I mean, it was, you know, negative, negative, negative. I'm having sidebars with all these kids, you know, after practice because this is their first time going through it. Murdoch asked Rutgers for the tapes of all of Mike Rice's practices over the course of, of two seasons at Rutgers. And because Rutgers is a state university, it couldn't refuse the request. Out of those public records, hundreds of hours of practice tape, Murdoch made a 30-minute clip reel focusing on Rice's temper tantrums, and he delivered it to Rutgers officials. Do you feel that Eric Murdoch sent the video to the school? Why did he send it to the school? You'd have to ask him on those type of questions. Uh, I can only answer and, and, and explain uh, or try to explain my actions. Rutgers launched an investigation. The report that the investigation produced didn't say you must fire Mike Rice. It condemned some of his actions, but for the most part, it didn't exactly exonerate him, but I think he felt that this was over. Rice was suspended for three games. Fines and lost income amounted to $75,000, and he was ordered to report to anger management counseling. Do you have an anger issue? That's what a lot of people ask, and that's the biggest misnomer, mis uh, fact. because if you watch practice, if anybody watched practice, I would lose self-control at times, yeah. But two minutes after that, or two minutes previous to that, I'm high-fiving and cheering. I could be th the same person that I did that to. I would, you know, be chest-pumping literally two minutes later. <laughs> With the suspension over, Rice was back in the game. I want to apologize to them. 
and allow them to understand that that I'm going to change, that you are going to be proud of this, this program. Rice thought the episode was behind him, but Eric Murdoch was just getting started. When we come back. Rice was fired today. The fiery coach goes down in flames. Can the most vilified coach in America bounce back to coach again? Marvell, shoot that! Hey, play the rebound! And so where do you go from here, Mike? Stay with us. Once again, Robin Roberts. Take a look at this shocking video making headlines this morning. On April 2nd, former assistant coach Eric Murdoch appeared on ESPN to denounce his former boss. To witness that video, I was like in total shock that this guy wasn't fired immediately on the spot. Embarrassed by the shocking expose of their basketball practices, under intense pressure, Rutgers University fired Mike Rice. Others followed. Rice's assistant coach, known as Baby Rice, who had also bullied players, resigned, as did Rutgers athletic director Tim Pernetti. Murdoch felt vindicated. Mike Rice's removal was long overdue. First step to stopping the mistreatment of Rutgers student athletes. And Coach Rice's reputation was in ruins. The degree of public shame that was heaped on this man uh, was was intense. I mean, almost in some ways unprecedented. He went from being an anonymous Division I college basketball coach to being a, a, really a, a, a sort of poster boy for everything that's wrong with, uh, with competitive sports in, in America. I've let so many people down, my players, my administration, Rutgers University, the fans. Go ahead, Kate. Most difficult going home, owning up to those kids, Michael and Katie, and his wife, Carrie. How did you talk to your children about this, your son and daughter? We talked a lot about um, daddy made some mistakes. Daddy's working on it. Daddy's always working on getting better. What I'm most proud about, and this is a lesson he's also told my children, there's no blame here on anybody else. Was it difficult to go home? I don't think people realize the, uh, you let your team down, you let your, your, your fans down, you let the parents, but your family, they're all a part of it. But to communicate to them that no, this is, this is nobody's fault except your father's fault. This is something that uh, I'm going to have to live with and uh, you're going to have to deal with. And this evening, more shockwaves after... Some of the harshest criticism came as a result of those anti-gay slurs. <laughs> Already a sensitive subject at Rutgers since 2010, when freshman Tyler Clemente took his own life. Now, he was the Rutgers University freshman who took his own life after video showing his sexual encounter with another man. You're at that same university and you're, you're shouting those names at your players. Did it ever occur to you that this is just really so far out of bounds? Idiotic, because I wasn't thinking that I was shouting at Tyler Clemente or anybody else who's a gay or lesbian. Looking for answers, Mike reached out to the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network. Eliza Byard is Glisson's president. He went with us to a specific training for PE teachers and coaches. He also had an experience of coaching students who would never show up on his team. It was really important that he meet with the students and hear from them. For these young people, this is a highly unlikely and difficult encounter. Two of the places that LGBT students avoid as much as they can are locker rooms and PE. They just don't want to be there. And frankly, they tell us they're more likely to talk to a cop than they are to a coach. All right, so we are now going to turn it over to Coach Mike Rice. And for Mike Rice, a major step in his search for redemption. It's hard talking about it. It's hard sitting in a classroom uh, full of gay and lesbian students and being told you're no better than a bully. The group did not hold back. So why is a gay man lower than a straight man? It doesn't make sense. My question to you, do you really realize what you did wrong? Oh, yeah. Do you really realize the impact? Yes. Yes, and I wouldn't be here facing you if I did. And until a girl says, you're no better than a bully who said something to me last week in front of my locker, who made me cry, and then, then the emotions poured out. Uh, she said, you're a leader. You're, you're a leader of student athlete. You help perpetuate that 
ugly stereotype that we're lesser, we're softer, we're this, we're that. Do you think that you were a bully? There were some actions that were certainly that were bullying, yes. Boy, that was, that was a hard lesson learned, that's for sure. Mike also traveled to Houston on his quest for insights into his behavior from former NBA player John Lucas, who runs a treatment center for recovering athletes. How did working with his group help you in dealing with your anger? John tells you the truth like no other person uh, maybe on this planet. Him relaying the stories as we're driving from gym to gym, just him saying it's okay to make mistakes. Until you forgive you, you can't forgive you. And I'm telling you, I have forgiven you. Therapy sessions went on for hours. Let me hear why we're doing this right. Let me say, I, I forgive myself. Not good enough. Yeah, that's going to take a while. No, let me hear it again. I forgive myself. No. Nope. It ain't going to be good enough. John really has a way of allowing yourself to understand that you are human, that you do make mistakes. There are some people that are always going to associate Mike Rice with that video, despite all that you have done. How do you reconcile that? By trying to be the best parent, the best coach, the best teacher, to get as much out as humanly possible to young coaches about self-control. Uh, about boundaries, about learning from your mistakes. Whoever Mike Rice becomes from here, I do think it's safe to say that he is being forced to deal with who he was. The great coaches somewhere along the way figure out that they need to be able to step outside themselves. They need to be able to listen to other people. That's sort of part of the process, I think, of learning really how to be a great coach. Let's go, hard work on three, good job. Today, Rice runs clinics for teenage boys. Attack the D, read it. Oh, I love that pass, Taj. And girls. Boom. With his 13-year-old daughter's team, Rice practices a new coaching style. No, match up, match up. His passion for the game still very much alive, and he has apparently reined it in. Pressure on the ball. They should never stand there and shoot. Go up strong. If you miss, so be it. Okay? There are many people saying there is no way this man should ever coach again. Well, that's something that I have to I have to live with. What I went through and 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 Everything that I've learned and the steps that I've taken and uh, how people have helped me along the way, yeah, I've, I've, I've changed. Uh, is it, will I be a work in progress? Yeah, of course. And so where do you go from here, Mike? Uh, you go and you continue, sorry. Uh, you go and continue to be a good father. You go and continue to learn uh, and try to develop. I, I want to be in a gym with student athletes. I want to be uh, a part of a team. Where that takes me, I'm not real sure. It's going to be so radical, this next drill. It's going to blow your mind. You heard Mike Rice tell Robin there that he hopes to one day coach again. So we ask you tonight, should he be allowed back on the court? Let us know on Twitter. Use the hashtag ABC2020. And don't go away tonight. Wait until you see what's caught on tape next. The doctor serving up something much stronger than coffee at Starbucks. Next, you're not going to believe this doctor's place of business. You would meet and treat patients at Starbucks? But it wasn't coffee that he was selling. How would they pay you? Things that under the table. And the police were recording on hidden camera. Coming up. Do you ever go into Starbucks for a quick coffee and wonder about some of the people who seem to be sitting there all day long setting up shop? Turns out one man was a doctor serving up something else and it wasn't coffee until a big sting and the tape he can't erase. Deborah Roberts tonight with the video and the embattled doctor talking only to 2020. With the Green Mermaid beckoning, it's where the world goes for its daily fix. Of caffeine, that is. But it's also the place where an ambitious doctor in Orange County, California, was caught on tape offering a different kind of fix, writing prescriptions for painkillers. You would meet and treat patients at Starbucks? Yes, I would, I would. 
It's pretty much the American dream, be your own boss, you know. But his dreams were doomed by what he thought was a clever way to finance a solo practice. A medical director by day, at night he began treating patients for pain management at the modern day office for the office-less. How do you even set up a practice in a coffee house? I, I realize that sounds a little strange. I mean, the patients would provide me medical records. I would listen to their heart. I would listen to their lungs. Yeah. You would pull out your stethoscope and yes. examine them. I would take in blood pressure. The Starbucks. Yes, I was doing that. Did you make an arrangement with Starbucks? Did you pay any rent? I did rent? not. I did not. Dr. Yi wasn't just poaching on private property, he was doling out prescriptions for the most powerful and addictive painkillers, like OxyContin, in exchange for fistfuls of cash. How would they pay you? Like, is it under the table kind of? Yes, it would be maybe inside of a coffee cup. Or, yes. But don't you see how that looks a little shady? You know, you're, I, you're I, examining, they're I, handing you money under the table, I they're putting it in a coffee. I understand. His practice at Starbucks soon commanded $600 for an initial visit. But the patients kept coming, a third of them in their 20s. One of those eager patients was Derek Roses, who was coping with an old lacrosse injury. I found out that he was going to see Dr. Yi a lot at Starbucks. Derek's mom, Tammy, wondered why her 20-year-old son needed such potent painkillers. I would find empty bottles of prescriptions in his car. What were the drugs? Oxycontin was the one that he used a lot of, that he got from Dr. Yi. Although there were many legitimate pain patients, there were a smaller percentage of what would be called professional patients, and some even would call them professional junkies. Dr. Yi says he had his own system in place to weed out problem patients, even hiring a drug counselor, but says some patients slipped through the cracks. They don't teach you this in medical school. They don't teach you anything about what happens on the streets. But, but they teach you ethics. And is it ethical to meet a patient in a coffee house? Well, I believe it was. Dr. Yi may have thought so, but the DEA did not. This is the first time uh, that I heard of a doctor using a food establishment uh, to conduct his business. With hidden cameras rolling, they launched an elaborate sting operation into Dr. Yi's practice. It was very important that the agents obtain as much evidence as possible to show, again, that this wasn't a one-time event. We want to show a pattern. In this undercover video being seen for the first time on national TV, Dr. Yi meets with an agent posing as a patient with no idea he's being watched. Smoke cigarettes? No. Not cigarettes. Okay. Any recreational drugs they should be aware of? They should be aware of? Not really. Okay. <laughs> 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 All right, I'll take that uh, on the need to know basis. Uh, Cavalier, flippant, Dr. Yi's more friend than physician. I was kind of laughing and joking at the same time, but to me, that's a bit of trying to maintain patient rapport. The agent left with prescriptions for 60 OxyContin, 60 Xanax, and 120 Roxycodone, and Dr. Yi pocketed $400. On another night, a different agent makes an appointment at Starbucks. Yeah, I used to have a heroin addiction like five, yeah. for five years out on and off. A patient admitting to being a heroin addict? Shocking. But not enough to stop Dr. Yi from writing scripts for 60 Roxycodone and 60 Xanax for the hefty price of 600 bucks. Why would you write her a prescription knowing that she has a history of heroin addiction? There are some people that uh, if they're not able to get access to their their pain meds, that they, they result to all the ways of treating it, and sometimes it's heroin. So that's one way I rationalized it. By September of 2011, with business booming, Dr. Yi had moved away from the foaming lattes to his own office space. That's where a DEA informant uncovered the most jaw-dropping abuse of that overused prescription pad, requesting drugs not just for herself, but for a friend who wasn't even there. She is in school. She can't make it. She is getting sick. So she asked me if I could get the script for her. You want to do hers first? Yeah, can we do hers first? Astoundingly, she walks out with everything she wanted, but not before Dr. Yi tried oh. to cover his tracks. Just between you and me, uh -huh. we met, you know. Totally. Yeah, that's fine. So. Yeah, all good. I got you. 
Dr. Yee wasn't concerned about the fact that the patient was not sitting before him. Uh, his only concern was the money. And the money was rolling in, sometimes as much as $5,000 a night. But the prescription business would soon have devastating consequences for Derek Rosas. During his four years as a patient of Dr. Yee, he had become addicted. The last thing he texted me was, I love you, Ma. And uh, he went to bed that night and he didn't wake up. What was the cause of death? Accidental, mixing this pill and this pill and this pill with beer. Do you think Dr. Yi knew that he was dealing with an addict? Yes, of course. Dr. Yi was never charged in Derek Rose's death and denies he ever knew he was an addict. I'm very, 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 very regretful that, that anybody had to die, okay? I, I... Did you ever deny a patient a prescription if they came to you wanting a narcotic? Do you remember ever saying, no, not this time? I don't remember. I don't remember. I, I believe it might have happened, but I, I can't recall specifically. After eight months of watching Dr. Yi, the DEA had seen enough. He was arrested and charged with 56 counts of prescribing controlled substances without a legitimate medical purpose. Doctor caught on video meeting with patients at a... Just weeks ago, facing trial and possibly life behind bars, Dr. Yi pleaded guilty to seven counts. A judge sentenced him to 11 years in a federal prison. What's the difference between his actions and the actions of a, of a drug dealer on the street corner? There is no difference. He's a drug dealer that just so happened to operate at a Starbucks. Dr. Yee begins serving his sentence this January, but we also wondered about the patients. Would you ever see a doctor at Starbucks? Tweet us. Use the hashtag ABC2020. And next here tonight, the young woman, the videos of her wildly drunk, and the wildly rich offers that came next. But will she take them? When we come back, what does it take to be labeled the, the drunkest idiot ever? I was really intoxicated, and I just thought it would be funny to tweet. Funny? From jail? What were you thinking? The sensational tweet from her jailhouse seat. Next. We've all seen the videos posted by perfect strangers because they think they're funny, and they are. The laughing babies, the wedding party falling off the dock. But what happens when you post something you think is funny, but it soon turns out the joke is on you? Tonight, the young woman, the drunken moments, and the images she can't erase. Here's Juju Chang. This is Vodka Sam in her heyday cradling her favorite drink like a newborn. Dissy is terrified of bottles. Her six-second Vine videos messing with her dog and her drunken gymnastics helped crown her the biggest party girl at the number one party school in the country. Yay! The University of Iowa, at least according to the Princeton Review. We're number one for a reason. <laughs> Let's see, we drink seven days out of the week. Sadly, it seems Samantha Gowdy never got the memo that what happens in college no longer stays in college. Thanks to social media, someone's always watching. So why did Deadspin label her the drunkest idiot ever? Well, she'd just been arrested for public intoxication, and then she took to Twitter while still drunk and still in jail. I still have my phone and I was really intoxicated and I just thought it'd be funny to tweet and let my friends know where I was and that wasn't good. That was when it all went south. Yeah. 140 characters later, and your life is completely changed yeah. forever. Call it TUI, tweeting under the influence. It all started in the morning, pre-gaming, pounding drinks before the tailgate at the football game. Sam was partying a lot, like really a lot. How many drinks do you think you might, might have had? I'm not sure. Three to five? Probably, yeah. More than five? I had a lot. And then once you get to the tailgate, how many did you have? Probably had like two to three drinks. So that could be as many as 10 drinks before you even got to the game. Yeah, it was bad. Probably should have just gone home, but didn't. Instead, Samantha stumbles into the stadium and somehow, she can't remember how, ends up on the football field. And yeah, there is a flag down there. Which turned out to be the worst play of the game. And my son had already called me because he was witnessing the whole thing happen. What did he say? He just said, Mom, Sam messed up big time. 
He said the police have her down at the edge of the field and they won't let me get to her. And what went through your mind? Panic. <laughs> The police gave her a breathalyzer, which came back 0 .341, four times the legal limit, an amount that could have killed her. Literally, 0 .3 could be fatal. Yeah. And you were 0 .341? Yeah. What were you thinking? I wasn't thinking at all. The cops took her to a holding cell, but forgot to confiscate her phone, which is when she started tweeting to her 200 or so followers. Just went to jail, YOLO, short for you only live once. And I'm gonna get .341 tattooed on me because it's so epic. I was just doing it for my friends. I wasn't doing it thinking, oh, this might get picked up by the entire country. My son and I just sat there and watched Twitter and it was just growing and growing and we knew it was bad. How did you know it was bad? When she was up to 25,000 followers within 24 hours. So how did she get so popular? Well, those tweets Sam thought she was sending just to her friends got picked up by the popular sports site Deadspin. They mocked her to their half million fans, naming her the drunkest idiot ever. Then even more people started following Vodka Sam on Twitter, where they discovered those party girl pics and sloppy vine videos. And while some proposed marriage, most people simply taunted her. Things live on the internet forever. Doesn't anyone get that? I know. She became the laughing stock of the news media. She should be a star. I'm naming my first kid 3.41. <laughs> All that internet infamy turned Vodka Sam into a any celebrity. She was offered endorsement deals. I heard that once it, everything went viral, that you got offers to do like promotions, liquor ads, t-shirt ads. Yeah, I immediately didn't want to do any of that. Because if I did that, then it would be promoting who I was portrayed as, and that's not who I am. I was really depressed. I just wanted to hide. But there's no place to hide on the internet. When you were posting, did you ever worry that things might go viral? No, that never crossed my mind. People would say, you know, come on, Sam, you're a smart college student. You're going to tell me you've never heard that embarrassing stories go viral? I mean, I've heard it with celebrities. I guess I just never thought it would happen to me. You were that naive. Yeah. She says Vodka Sam is dead and buried. She shut down all her accounts, though parody accounts are still out there. I think that I learned my lesson and I won't be going back to social media. Ever? No. In a funny way, had you not been arrested, you would have continued getting super drunk, right? I probably uh, needed a wake-up call and I got one. Sam says she's quit drinking altogether, thanks in part to the three months of treatment the University of Iowa required her to attend. But she admits being sober leaves her socially isolated. Still, she says she has no one to blame but herself. It's not like you're saying the bloggers did this no, to me. I did it to myself. It's just they picked up the story and, you know, kind of got it wrong, but it was still my fault for letting them get the story, so. Next, to serve, protect, and peep. This practice appears to be a peep show. I was on display for them. Police pat downs. Do some have more than just looking for weapons in mind? Coming up. We turn tonight to the tapes the police can't erase, the pat downs, the searches, and the women who say those investigators were searching for far more than evidence. Tonight, see the video for yourself. You decide, peep show or police pro. Once again, Deborah Roberts. No matter where you go these days, chances are you're being watched. But cameras are also recording the men in blue, too. And if they step out of line, the video's there to tell the tale. And there's plenty of video to watch at the jail in Puyallup, Washington. We believe that jail safety cameras are a absolute necessary for life and safety over privacy. When you step foot into a correctional institution, your expectation of privacy is greatly diminished. That's putting it mildly, according to these women who claim they're victims in the case of the video voyeurs. The four describe their ordeals, but are too embarrassed to show their faces. It was a very awful experience, and it was humiliating, embarrassing. The anger of knowing that somebody has these videos, and it's happening to all these other women. 
The revealing videos were uncovered when defense attorney James Egan began researching public records for a DUI client. I've represented thousands of people in DUIs and I've never seen this. Turns out cops in Puyallup have been videotaping young women, most of them detained for DUI, as they change clothes and use the toilet. This practice appears to be a peep show. Even though the jail does have curtained areas for changing in private, these women were all sent to a holding cell with a camera overhead and told to strip. I felt like a doll. They were just dressing up and dressing down. I was on display for them. They were made to change into jail clothes for their mug shots, then told to undress again before being released. We have you change into jail clothing because it's very common for offenders to hide items and places on their body or within their clothing. This is protocol? Well, that's funny, because you're the only ones that are doing it. Egan has now filed lawsuits on behalf of dozens of women convinced the cops use the jailhouse cameras for a free show. I'm extremely angry. They're there to serve and protect us. And they completely took advantage of each and every one of us. If you're expecting an apology from the police, forget it. The department insists its video monitoring is legal and appropriate. We don't believe there's any merit to the allegations that our corrections officers did anything wrong whatsoever. We do not have officers sitting there monitoring the cameras when that type of activity is going on. And in fact, all of these cases, there are no officers viewing the video or the monitor at any time through any of the allegations. But the women aren't buying it. Yeah, it was really cold in there and I asked for a blanket and he told me to, if I do jumping jacks, he'll be watching me. Don't do jumping jacks naked because I'll be watching. The Washington case isn't the only instance where cameras have landed police in hot water. Take the case of the problematic pat-down in Texas last year. A state trooper pulls over a 38-year-old woman and her 24-year-old niece for littering, claiming they were acting weird. When his female backup arrives, the weirdness kicks into overdrive. Suspected of hiding drugs, the women say they were forced to submit to a body cavity search on camera in full view of passing cars. And watch this. The horrified victims say the officer didn't even bother to change latex gloves between searches. <sighs> That's gross. That is gross. Bobby Ramos spent 20 years as a cop in the NYPD. Is there ever a reason to do this kind of a search no. out by no. the roadside? No, absolutely not. This is like, and the idea that she's doing this in front of her dash cam is outrageous. The female officer was fired. Her male counterpart suspended. Still, if you think that's bad, consider the case of the strange strip search. 33-year-old Dana Holmes was speeding home from a wedding when cops pulled her over. She fails a breathalyzer test and is carted off to jail. But now her evening's about to go from bad to worse. As she's being booked into the LaSalle County Jail, Holmes is told to stand up, spread her arms and legs as she faces the wall. During the search, a female deputy lifts Holmes' left foot. I had no problem with the female guard patting me down. Then attempts to do the same with the right. I was cooperating. She told me to lift. I did. In their incident report, the officers allege Holmes tried to kick them. The deputies pounce.